Uh, I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education here at The Modern, and it is my um, privilege to, um, and pleasure to welcome you to Tuesday evenings at The Modern. Um, I never pass up the opportunity to report that Tuesday evenings is free and open to the public, a fact I'm very proud of. Um, so um, please pass on the word. Um, we have actually, we are approaching the end of this Tuesday evening season, and um, I'm closing it with my favorites. Um, next week, I made that point last week, and it is certainly true this week and next. Next week, we take a break for Halloween, and then we return on November 7th, so be sure you note that on your calendar. Don't come here for Halloween. There will, we are accepting no trick-or-treaters. Um, and then, but we'll get back together on November 7th for the last lecture in which the writer, curator, and podcaster, uh, Helen Molesworth, reads from the recently released Fiden publication, Open Questions, 30 Years of Writing About Art, followed by a conversation with me and Helen on how um, she, uh, her vast and impressive career is reflected in the in the book um, or in her writing. So I think it's gonna be really interesting. I'm super excited about it. Um, afterwards, there will be a book signing with the books available in um, the Modern Shop before the lecture and after. They may be there now, I'm not sure, but you can check or however you get your books. Um, so I hope you will make plans to be back with us on November 7th um, for a farewell uh, lecture. Um, that I think will um, be a good way to go out. Tonight is extremely um, special for me, and I think the same will be true for you. Kate Shepard um, graciously accepted uh, my invitation to be here tonight despite the demands of her life as an artist and otherwise, but um, I think predominantly her commitment to her practice. Um, as Mary uh, Sabatino, of Gallery Lalong and Company, uh, which represents Kate in her work, put it in an online conversation with Kate during the um, 2020 solo exhibition surveillance, quote, Kate is an amazing painter, rigorous in every way. Rigorous, sensitive, and open to complexity, Kate described her own intentions in a conversation <clears throat> with William Smith, the editor of um, Art in America, as seeking to imbue her paintings with, quote, spookiness, loneliness, love, and sweetness. So see what I mean? Tonight's gonna be great. <laughs> um, Kate Shepard is a New York-based artist who grew up in the city. She began her art education with a BA at Oberlin College in Ohio, returning to New York to attend the Institute for Architecture and Suburban, I mean, and Urban Studies. Um, the New York Academy of Art, and then uh, attending Skohegan uh, School of Painting and Sculpture, then going on to receive an MFA at SVA, so the um, School of Visual Arts in New York. She has uh, shown her work internationally and can be found in uh, important collections around the globe, including the Albright Knox Gallery Buffalo, in Buffalo, um, LA County Museum, of Art, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Phillips Collection, which is in DC, the Menil Collection in Houston, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, and the Morgan Library and Museum in New York, to name a few. In addition to her painting practice, Kate has a long-standing commitment to printmaking. She has self-published um, and made editions with and for Pace Prints, Chinati uh, Foundation, Dudonne uh, Lower East Side Print Shop, and Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. As mentioned, she is represented by Gallery Lalong and Company in Paris um, and in New York, um, as well as Josh Pazda Hiram Butler Gallery in Houston, uh, Krakow um, Witkin Gallery in um, Boston, and Anthony Meyer Fine Arts of San Francisco, where she had a solo exhibition titled Something About Shapes last spring. I um, could go on for a long time, 
but I know what uh, is in store and I know that that is what you came for. So if you would, please join me in a warm welcome for Kate Shepard. Thank you, Terry. That was beautiful. And thank you all for coming. I'm happy to be here on this rainy night. Um, my goal this evening is not to present an overview of my work. If I were to do that, I would have to include sculptures, prints, and cut paper pieces. Rather, I want to talk about my interest in line and how it defines space. It carried me for a long time. Lately, I've let line go, but the transition makes sense, and I'll include some recent images related to that transition. So I'm going to walk you through from my beginning. Can you hear? No. no. OK. Can you hear now? A little bit better? I'll try to talk into the mic. There are many ways to make a line. And there are many things to depict, so I did a lot of exploring. The magic was looking for and finding subject matter <clears throat> that lent itself to my method or language of working. I wanted to convey both a programmatic diagram but also an emotional warmth. This is an example of images that I have in a vast file of found imagery that I get from photographing things that I find. The subject of the talk came to me when I was at my mother's house this summer where I found my sketch pads from the mid 80s. I was stu struck by how my past interests resonated with my subsequent paintings. The schools I attended were strict. We were encouraged to become better in technical ways. We did life drawing and painting every day. Early on, I was interested in placing the body in a way that it felt grounded and directional. I focused on landmarks, including the shoulders, nipples, hip bones, knees, not only to show the tilt of the body, but also the perspective in relationship to the viewer. It treats the body as symmetrical architecture. Later, my paintings weren't explicitly figurative, but I wanted them to hint at a human presence. On the right is a painting from 30 years later, a standing figure composition I made when Obama came into office. I wanted to express dignity and grace through this posture. I'm not necessarily a conceptual artist. I always follow my hand and the materials and passion for figuring something out. In some of the older drawings, I recognize an interest in weight, like an adherence to gravity that has been a touchstone for me. On the right is a diptych from 2014 in order to show you how I maintain that focus in postures. Early on, I refrained from using curved lines. I wanted to find angles in the body. It was OK to show evidence of searching. I see now that I was looking for the right line weight without knowing I was doing that. So here it is wispy, and here it is too heavy. But I can see that I was treating the body as an envelope for a building-like structure. More and more, I felt that to breathe life into the shapes that lines contain, I would stop describing the insides. I saw the body as a pocket, a container for a soul. I was feeling the life without filling it with description. This simplification carried through to my later work. I copied old master paintings a lot. These are thumbnails with hatch mark lines. My friends and I used to say that a finished painting should be as interesting as the initial thumbnail, and I started liking these drawings more than detailed and labor larger ones. I was drawn to simplifying an image to its essential structure. Sometimes the sketches were rather abstract, but I could always tell the direction the figure was looking. You might recognize some of these paintings. And here I capture both the figure and the architecture. After four years, I found myself paring things down even more. I started drawing with paint on a monochromatic field. This was a clue to how I would continue to work. 
I started to see differently. The monochromatic field remained, but the figure was disappearing more and more. To be honest, I had nothing more to say with figurative painting. Eventually, I lost the image entirely. I was in Nantucket trying to make paintings of lighthouses so that I could sell them, and these monochromatics started popping up. I did make the lighthouse drawings, too. <laughs> and they did sell. In, in 1995, I was invited to do a residency at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire. I didn't know how, what materials to bring with me, but I had this tingling sense that the next work I would do would be tiny. While browsing in the hardware store in a rather abrupt sea change, I found myself gravitating towards the small paint chip samples. I decided to use them to draw upon. I'd only be able to f hold a bare minimum of information, which gave me an excuse to keep it simple. Here's my version of the sun-made raisin lady. After drawing a slew of things, I became more involved with geometry. And at a residency for the, at the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas in 1995, on the tiny paint chip samples, I became interested in paring down the subject matter even more. Often, I wanted to provide just enough difference to show an angle shift. After making these teeny drawings, I knew I had to leap and make paintings in a larger scale. The challenge was to find a way to make a line that was delicate and personal as the pencil, but larger. I tried many different approaches. Here is an example from the late 90s where I was using masking tape, but ultimately this method felt mechanical. After some trial and error, I decided to use oil paint and a fine brush. To make the surface smooth and wall-like, I used wood panels and continued with the simplest means to convey a space. Here is a detail of a later painting so you can see the hand. The marks are precise while also holding some warmth. I didn't want to make an expressive line, but I wanted it to be my own hand, sort of like a back-of-the-envelope sketch but more controlled. Upon first glance, some people think that the lines are etched but into the surface, but it's not the case. This is the kind of brush I use for the lines, or this is the kind of brush I use for the lines. The long bristles are perfect for holding paint over an expanse. It's called a script brush. When Robert Simmons stopped making them, I bought a lifetime supply and put half in a metal drawer in case of fire. <laughs> Around 1999, I started to be obsessed with boxes, especially long ones in the flower district. They were full of pregnant space, and they could trick the eye in how the lines flipped back and forth. In a diagrammatic way, they had an anthropomorphic quality. I painted some upright and gave them an arched posture and a little attitude. In 1999, the Lannan Foundation invited me to work with a foundry, and after realizing that I wouldn't be able to make sculptures out of lines, per se, I decided to cast boxes from the supermarket to show how they were folded and perforated. That would be the linear content. So you can see on the top that beautiful detail. The boxes eventually became spaces opening up. I imagine moving through the lines as though they were interiors. I imagine you'd peer into a hallway which turned to the left. The only rule for the color was that it had to be dark enough to show the white lines. So this painting is called Pass the Painting Hallway to the Left as though you're at a dinner party and somebody is giving you instructions to the bathroom. <laughs> In the early 2000s, I had a studio in a stripped-out apartment with plenty of windows. I remember making this skeletal painting with, after stripping, shipping out a show. There's a freshness in the green, emptied space. The bifurcation of, and variation in color lent a kind of light. In between the panels is a gap that asked the viewer to complete the line. 
I started to use an enamel from Holland. In part, I chose this paint because I wanted it to be impervious to handprints. This photo is from a, year, a few years later, but I wanted to show you how saturated and reflective the surfaces are. When the gallery documents the work, it's lit so that you can see the lines, but in the paintings, the room is often reflected to the degree that you have to stand in just the right place to see the image. I wanted the line work to be delicate and the surface to be rough, and this was the balance. In 2003, the US invaded Iraq. I read the paper daily and I worried. So I painted this as a respite, sort of a calm spot in a time of chaos. One transparent wall is in front of a room of two shades of cool gray. The skeletal form is airy and light, but also definitive. In doing this talk, I remembered that the gap in the panels was meant to replicate the white strips between the paint chips. Because I was making spaces in roughly two-point perspective, I taped thread on the left and right sides of a long wall so that I could draft a credible space. For Pace Editions, I literally used thread to make the images. The printer shot a screen from a drawing in thread so that we could print the image on enamel-coated paper. In this one, there is no slack and the thread is, is rather hidden because I erased the end parts of the threads. But here they are visible. <clears throat> you can see where the outer walls are curled. I changed the color of the line to show where the wall is angling back. Then I started focusing on the ground. I looked for repeating patterns so that the regularity could illustrate distance. The first one was inspired by my mother's brick patio. I wanted the lines to zoom back in space and side to side. Because I couldn't figure out the images with threads anymore, I started working with a young architect student to figure out things on the computer. This is one of the paintings I made from that series. I love how the herringbone pattern changes from side to side. If I remember correctly, the viewer's position is towards the right, exactly at the vertical panel break. Here's the painting installed in order to show you the scale of the painting which I meant to envelop the viewer. In sum, I broke the horizon line and by changing the dimensions of the panels, I was asking you to imagine something behind whichever wall was in front. This is what I called a lace pattern which I drew and redrew over the course of years. I think I called this painting Superman, but I'm not sure. And by using that same pattern upright, the notion of looking through it became an option. This opened up a new possibility because the pattern was sheer and you could see beyond it. Here's another instance of seeing through the line work. It looks like a bamboo curtain to me. I love the organic quality of the repeating lines and the subtle angle shift from top to bottom. Flying over farmland gave me the idea to depict agriculture as a linear structure. I made a bright orange, I made it bright orange so as to create some sort of rift, a counterbalance. Eventually, this motif became the poster for the Roland Garros tennis tournament in Paris. The committee chose it because the courts are covered with red clay. So while all my line work is, was straight, never curved, that became really apparent in the next few paintings. By repeating layers of linear patterns that appeared to be random but weren't, I recognized that they would look like a snowstorm or a rainstorm. I named this painting after David Patterson, New York's first African-American governor and first blind chief executive. 
This is called modern dance stage. There are three symmetrical planes that zigzag forward. It was important for me that the lines have a logic so the space would feel credible. After it was done, I imagined a perfect atmosphere for a figure to move through, kind of like a Noguchi stage set for Appalachian Spring by Martha Graham. That's why I named the painting Modern Dance Stage. Drawing a typical scaffold was a perfect excuse not only to show lines, but also the placement of your own eyes. It's a structure with a repeating pattern, which you're seeing from above or below or at eye level. I like that the structure is meant to protect, but is also delicate in this painting. Dark lines on top contrast with the light gray. This is one of the rare times I change the paint on my brush midway through. Another occurrence of that was this seascape, which I did in order to reference light on water. I came upon this pole in Brooklyn around this time. A ha the hair-like lines supported it. Supporting it continued to thrill me. I could use that fineness of line and still make a visible image if the image were busy. I didn't start with a reference first here, but afterwards I thought of some string hobby project. It was sort of a nod to handwork while also being architectural. I asked myself, what would happen if things were falling or hanging? This painting was an offshoot of one of a building that I had been drawing with transparent walls. At a certain point, it made sense to free the walls, free the floors and let them float. I started a long-lasting working relationship with a man who helped me with computer work. When he moved out of New York, we started working with sharing each other's screens. We figured out a way to make waves with the same pattern I referred to earlier as lace. More and more, we treated the form as though it were elastic. Most often, I use the vertical proportion of the human figure. I think this is the narrowest one I made. We worked on a continuous arc of experimentation. There are infinite options with the computer, so I had to know how far to take it. At a certain point, I was trying to activate the surface more, enlivening it from being a flat plane to being like a hanging fragment or skin or fabric. While, this, while we did use this, many examples of, this ex, of these experiments, I felt this was overkill and rather grotesque. I thought it looked like tripe. Here is another use of a wave. Eventually I destroyed this painting because I thought it was too literal, I now regret that, and gave it too much, and I thought I was giving it too much information, or giving too much information, but it's a good example of what I'm trying to show about movement, and still they're only using straight lines. This one you have to work to see, the subtle curl at the bottom as the focus of the painting. I called this series Gay Hen Wilson because they looked like something sagging. I named it after the cartoonist whose facial expressions always made me pause. I, I know his work from the New Yorker magazine. He, he died a few years ago, unfortunately, as did many New Yorker cartoonists in the last eight years or so. Moving away from a repeating pattern, I started to build gnarled organic structures out of hundreds of little line segments in a 3D program. 
I would then manipulate them in an animation program until they looked like they had a presence. I thought of something deflated, like a sewn animal without stuffing, hanging in its own weight. I think I called this Red Rabbit. It's at the Phillips Collection, and I was, I'm really proud of, of that, that it's hanging there with, with, two, with three other paintings that were from a show at the Phillips. And it was a show in response to Mondrian, so I used um, a, a blue painting, a red painting, and a yellow painting, and then I had white puzzles, um, white and black puzzles, jigsaw puzzles on the, on, the, on the table. Here's another version of the painting, but with reflections in my studio. I was really hesitant about how I put this image in the center, but I knew it belonged in the center, and then I remembered Barnett Zoom and Zips, and it put me at ease. <laughs> when I move from one body of work to another, I tend to rebel, rebel against myself, I guess. These experiments with fractured lines represented a break with the order of my previous work. Eventually it grew into a whole series of paintings based on this idea of things breaking down and becoming chaotic. Collectively, they felt like opening a closet door and letting the contents spill out. I thought about like sports equipment, hockey sticks and things like that. And that's a reflection of, my, of another painting on the wall on the right side. With a similar chaotic configuration, I wanted to convey a hectic wire sculpture that would stand erect like a television antenna, but also a figure. I called this the future painting. While drawing on the computer, I moved the lines around until they su suggested an abstracted body. I wanted to feel a sense of movement and focus. I think the one... Sometimes I found inspiration in more literal ways. During a trip to France, I was struck by the stone walls and decided to paint them. It would take careful drawing to, con to convert the, the shapes into discrete lines. This is called blanket stones. Its blue harkens back to my childhood blanket with satin edges. It connotes comfort, a contradiction to the hardness of the stones. Each turn with the stone was articulated with a different line. There aren't any pure rectangles. That's a detail. This is the kind of template I used. It's, it is printed on paper at full scale and then overlaid on top of the panel. That was a big job. By zooming in, you can see tiny circles that show the line breaks. I used a pin to poke holes through every circle, then took the paper away and used my brush to connect the dots. In the interest of putting the walls in perspective, I had to pare down the template by taking all the vertical lines from the individual stones and leaving the jagged horizontals. This way I could overlap the planes and see through them. This was a commission for somebody in Miami who um, was a piano player and I thought really long and hard about how to uh, respond to a piano and I, 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 I wound up doing this instead, but I gave her a choice of a couple options. I remember walking in Central Park one day and admiring the lines of cracks in the walkways. After a while of thinking about them, I returned to document the pavement and I drew the configurations. I was so glad that they hadn't repaved the space. 
And then I made a series of laser cut works out of thin plywood. This one is painted off white and it reminds me of a hard boiled egg. And since the cracks originated on the ground, I put a large expanse on the floor in the gallery for a show called The Telephone Game. Sometimes I use lines to make pictures of things and sometimes I make pictures of lines. In 2016, I began to look for ways to deal with gravity where nothing touches the ground. Finally, I found a way to paint curves. I hung threads on the panel, photographed them, and had a tool made that would steady my hand. Here are examples of catenary lines. Catenary lines assume this shape, acting upon the gravity of how they hang in space. So there's, Terry, we were thinking, talking about that earlier. I had these tools made to guide my hand and depict a certain exact shape that had been made actually. I also used different wooden tools so that a painting line, painted line could replicate hanging threads. I've always loved Rembrandt's etchings because they convey atmosphere in such an abstract yet systematic way. I haven't shown many drawings today, but here is one on screen printed paper. I always draw on screen printed paper. It's a beautiful surface that um, adds a lot of pre-existing color. Starting in 2008, I began to play with pulling the lines out of the paintings and into the real world. I used coat hangers to make an envelope of space, which reminds me of the early drawings. I also started to imagine that the painted line represented an object itself, like an outdoor sculpture on a stand. I wanted to see how the wire line could be expressive in the slightest way while the color knocks you over the head with how literal it is. Bubble gum on the sidewalk or salt on a table always puts me in a dreamy state and I start imagining shapes within them. At a certain point, I wanted to add something to disrupt my perfect finish. I tried sand and dirt, but then landed on some larger things like beans, which could delay how the paint dried. Underneath the black were coats of bright color. When I took the assortment of things like chickpeas and dried corn, off, I would reveal the color underneath. In a way, this was my usual process, but in reverse. Instead of starting with a linear composition, I had a field of points that would suggest, that would suggest lines. I think that's what it says. That would suggest where the lines could go. In this painting, the dots created an excuse to make a constellation map. And here the grid, and here the grid implies a scope or a glass window. Well, now I'm starting to ask myself how to justify all this talk about straight lines. First, it's a vestige of my figure drawing, but in technical terms, it's because I use straight, a straight stick to steady my hand. It's called a mall stick, and I have them made. I want, an even, I want an even line which describes a form rather than calling attention to itself in an expressive way. I thought about straight lines in nature and how I could achieve grace and life and return to the figure. Order and chaos came, com kept coming up when I started to trace silhouettes of computer avatars while simulating three-dimensionality. In an architecture program, I turned my drawing into until it no longer made sense. So I'd, I'd make a drawing and then rotate it, and while I rotated it, all the lines sort of 
started to converge. These three images show a female figure distorted and then coming into view. The panels here imply a progression in time and space. The title of this painting is this, the uh, file, the computer file that it came from. On the left is an example of an avatar model. They're used in computer games. I also, I only use the essential lines to describe the posture. Of course, it brought me back to the figure drawings I had done 30 years prior. I think Orson Welles sums it up here. I want to give the audience a hint of a scene, no more than that. Give them too much and they won't contribute anything themselves. Give them just a suggestion and you get them working with you. So I showed you, that I read that to you after looking at this painting on the right where I don't show you a division between the legs. I thought about that quote. I found that using a resist process with etching ink would make a more active line, so I let go of the brush. I rolled out ink on heavy glassine and put it face down on the panel and scribed onto it, which left extraneous marks. Of course, the horizon line was implied and there was accidental imagery. More and more I thought about Whistler's nocturnes, a seascape with distance lights, also Battlezone, the computer game from the 1980s. I used a wooden piece from the Central Park crack fragments to trace a shape with etching ink. I was thinking that it would be an abstract table sculpture looking image, but a profile of a figure became apparent. Do you see it? A grid is an obvious go-to, but I wanted to make it, make use of it somehow. I let the debris of the ink be like bugs on a screen. This drawing was a sketch for a project I did in Houston during the pandemic, which was about the gallery space itself. I was adhering to perspect perspectival space and then letting it fall apart from a different vantage point. The dotted line was made with a pattern making tool that rotates. Then I drew the reconfigured walls within a sort of envelope. As you've seen in previous images, this is how reflective the surfaces are. In 2018, a young artist came to my studio. Her work deals with irony. The first thing she said was, what's up with the shiny paint? <laughs> and I gave her my standard answer, which was that the lines were delicate and the surface was hardy and repellent. But in truth, I realized I had never addressed it head on. So I started to set, set up blank panels against various walls in the studio, and I took photos of what the pa panels reflected. Then I screen printed those images back onto the panels so that the reflections were permanently documented, and that became the, uh, the subject of the painting. And you might see it, but that's in a, this is an early painting, and my iPhone is captured with me on the right side taking the picture. And those are the windows in my studio. This is a print of my studio being reflected. So this is another printed image of what the panel saw. Letting the panels make the images meant I would depict a shape without any diagrammatic lines. I just let them go. The striations of the images are a product of brushing on the enamel paint. Then I discovered that the ceiling fluorescent fixtures, receding lines could be implied. The white here is printed on the blue panels and the subsequent shapes are reflections of the walls and paintings. 
Here is my ceiling with the lights off so that the pipes could be captured too. Their perfect parallel format recedes in perspective. I took this photo in the evening just before leaving, which explains the super soft light. Bonard said, I am trying to do with, I am trying to do what I have never done, give the impression one has in entering a room, one sees everything and at the same time, nothing. Grayscales are so satisfying to me. This is a series of one, of one fluorescent light repeated. I wasn't interested in letting go of image making completely. At the same time that I was simulating reflections on some panels, I started to isolate where the reflect actual reflections would take place in a separate body of work. I sanded the paint first so that it would no longer be active in the environment, and then I added unadulterated enamel which would reflect the room selectively. And you can see in the dark rectangle that that is my window. As you move, the paintings reflect the room and change as the light hits from different angles. Every time the painting is seen, it would be different. I'd like to include uh, two of my most recent paintings where the rectangles are rather thin. I don't quite know where these compositions are going, but I know that I am still committed to making spaces that invite you in. So are the lines coming back? I honestly don't know. But regardless, what I have come to realize is that the most important thing in my paintings is to offer you a place to be. It could be a physical place or an emotional place, but ideally both. I'll continue chasing after that in whatever form. Thank you for joining me as I revisited this progression. That's it. <laughs>